Welcome to the Homeschool Advantage podcast. I'm your host, Bex Buzzy, and today we will be talking about homeschooling children with special needs in learning. And to do that, we have CEO and founder of Sped Homeschooling, Peggy Ployer. You will hear her heart, her passion, as she shares the depths of emotional truths from her life of learning differences and being on the spectrum. This is a podcast you do not want to miss. Let's get into the show. Today's guest is Peggy Ployer. She is the founder and CEO of Sped Homeschool. She was a physicist who turned home educator, left a lucrative career in medical device industry to teach the struggling learners in her own home after her oldest son was diagnosed with Asperger's syndrome. Peggy is the former Texas Homeschool Coalition Special Needs Team Lead, Minnesota Association of Christian Home Educators Special Needs Coordinator, Mothers of Preschool Area Coordinator for Minnesota, North Dakota, and South Dakota. She is certified by the American Association of Christian Counselors and trained as a precept Bible study leader. She is also very open about her own autistic tendencies and quirkiness. In her free time, Peggy enjoys aerial silks, paddle boarding, vegan cooking, hiking, and reading. And you can tune in every Tuesday as Peggy hosts Empowering Homeschool Conversations, a weekly talk show that focuses on homeschooling unique learners. Or you can join her every weekday on her podcast, Daily Revelations. Well, welcome, Peggy. I'm so excited to have you on. Well, thanks for having me, Bex. I'm excited to share and and just to um, be able to encourage your audience. What is Mm -hmm. one misconception that most have about special needs homeschooling? Oh, that's a good question. Um, So a lot of times when we're at conferences, parents will come up to us and say, okay, so this is my child's diagnosis. Now tell me the right curriculum I need to use for that diagnosis. And my team gets, has gotten so frustrated because they're like, we have to tell them every time there's no one curriculum based on a diagnosis. Cause I mean, you, you hear it said, you meet one child with autism, you meet one child with autism, you meet one child with down syndrome, you meet one child with down syndrome. Every child is different. And that means the curriculum that works best for them is going to be different, which makes it hard because a lot of families want a quick fix, but finding that perfect match and often an eclectic mix um, is is the best route, which is really hard because a lot of our parents come into the homeschooling community, not by plan or choice. It's usually out of necessity because what their child is getting in the public school, the private school is not meeting their needs and homeschooling becomes their last ditch effort to help their child and they're desperate to find something that works and to help them to, to just learn and to enjoy learning again. Oh, and I, I wanted to circle back really quick. You said that a lot of parents come in with that one diagnosis. Is that possibly because the public school system has like just that one type of way of helping a child, a private school that they don't, maybe they don't have the resources to be able to be that diverse where in homeschooling you're able to really get a focus on that's a really good good perception exactly so a lot of times a public school or district will buy one curriculum to meet one diagnostic need and that will be the one that they use it's not that it's the best choice sometimes it was just influenced by who's using it um who's in charge of spending the money. (laughs) Um, It was a cheap product. There's a lot of different reasons. But as a homeschool parent, the possibilities are endless. And oftentimes, if you do them on your own, you can find ways to apply them at very much less cost than the school district or school would have to pay. (laughs) Oh, wow. That's really interesting. So, um, Peggy, you're you're a nonprofit, right? So yes, your what is the focus of your organization? Like, what does your organization focus on with special needs? 
Yeah. So our goal overall is just to empower the family um, and the parents of these unique learners. And we do that provide by providing resources so that the parents can customize their child's education to meet their unique needs, which means we have to offer a lot of different resources because parents need different things. And so we can connect them with curriculum providers that offer curriculum products that are a little more flexible. Um, we introduce them on my live shows to experts that may be helpful in areas where their child is most struggling and to give them some ideas on how they may be able to change and tweak and accommodate or modify that curriculum. And, and then we have, we have blogs, we have a variety of different ways that parents can, um, can help their child, even doing therapy at home. A lot of parents don't even think that's even possible, but there's a lot of free resources out there or very inexpensive resources or therapists who are willing to come along and train a parent instead of having them pay over and over again for therapy services. So there's, there's a lot of ways that families can implement these special education, um, strategies that maybe they haven't even thought of before, but we introduce parents to those to really empower them to do what they need to do for their child to meet their economic needs and, and really customize their education. Wow. So I just want to talk to the parents out there. One of the biggest uh, nuggets I got right out of this is that you you're basically going to have a lot of help first off, you have a <laughs> lot of resources and your child is not going to be another number or right. is this not going to be like everybody else? Because we all know that our children are not, our children are very individual and they deserve to have that type of curriculum, that type of education, that type of experience. Mm -hmm. that type of re-loving to learn again. Yeah. So I, I think that's like a huge takeaway. You said that people will train them. So do parents mm -hmm. have to have like a certification or can they come as is? Just as they are willing to, to learn. Um, and some therapists will, they publish their information just on their website and it's written for parents. So this is what you need to do if you're working on like the sound as a, for speech therapy. Um, and then there's a, also these educational therapists who will work alongside parents. That's the beauty of therapy outside of public school. A lot of parents don't understand that when you, a, your child does therapy in the public school, that the therapist rarely talk to the parent. And so they have this therapy session at school and then nobody continues on the, that work until they go to therapy again. For therapy to be effective, it needs to be repeated a lot. So it's gonna be more effective if the parent is involved in that process. And for therapists that are outside the public school system, they really do desire to work with the parents. And so the therapists that are listed on our website, I actually interview and vet every resource that's on our website. And I make sure that they're passionate about helping you. A lot of them say, I want them to email me. I want them to call me. I want them to ask the questions because we really want to help. And there are people out there that do. So have you, have, have there been parents that maybe don't want to be as involved? Um, and can you make a comparison to parents who have been more involved, how the child actually develops differently, like sure. maybe develops a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it, it's harder for the child when the parent isn't involved. And there's, there's studies that show that a child's success in school even has more to do with the parent involvement than the, the teaching instruction in the school. Um, and so you're going to explode that factor when you bring your kids home and all of a sudden you're involved all the time because your kids know that this is a value to you and then it becomes a family value. And, and so seeing them succeed, slowing things down at their own pace, not pushing them too hard um, in places where they really struggle because this is the, you know, this is the grade level you should be at. This is, you know, the reading level you should be at. And so let's push you harder, harder, harder instead of, oh, I see your struggle. And so let's just take this as slow as you need to, because mastery is more important than just moving you along to the next grade. That is so true. I, I mean, I'm a public school teacher. I still am a public school teacher and I stay there because I feel like right now 
I just need to be able to be that light for a lot of mm-hmm. my students. Mm-hmm. And it is so true. The students of mine who do the best, their parents are very much involved. And the ones who don't do very well, their parents are not involved. Mm-hmm. I mean, and, or if they're vo- involved, it's so minimal yeah. that it's barely noticeable. And mm-hmm. it's so true. I, I like... I today even had a conversation with the father who um, didn't know that his son wasn't going to class. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. I was like, oh, I haven't seen your son. And he's like, what? <laughs> he mm. no and, you know, that and right there to me was a huge indicator, like how important it is for, for parents to be involved. Because once the father today, mm-hmm. once he got involved, The son was very much like, yes, I'll be there. Yes, I'll do this. Mm -hmm. I I believe that relationship, it just bonds them more and just brings them together. And I I think a lot of times parents don't realize their value Mm -hmm. in their own child's life. Exactly. And and that to me is like, I I know even my, my own story. When my mom was involved for my schooling, I always excelled. I mm-hmm. always, she was my cheerleader, you know, and I was able to, you know, be able to just be my best. Right. So, I love that. So can you talk more about maybe your story and your, um, how your, how this all came about, like your children and. Sure. And- yeah. Well, I, I went to my first homeschool conference when my kids were preschoolers and I came home and told my husband, they, that is not my group of people <laughs> and I will never homeschool. <laughs> Uh, don't tell God anything like that (laughs) because he laughs at you. Um, So I sent my oldest to private school when he was in kindergarten and he was in the principal's office every day. And um, towards the middle of the year, the principal sat me down and said, I think he needs to be tested because at that point I was just blaming myself. Um, There was just a lot of things that I did not understand about my son. And, and it was just kind of getting out of hand with, um, his emotional issues and and things. And so I was like, diagnosed for what? And she wouldn't say anything because of course, as, as a public educator, she couldn't diagnose. And so he was diagnosed on the autism spectrum. At that time, they were diagnosing high functioning autism as Asperger's. Now it's considered a spectrum disorder, um, but that was like the aha moment for me. Um, because when I came back to the principal, she handed me a packet of information. There was only two books that existed at that time about high functioning autism. That's how new it was of a diagnosis. And so I was charting new territory, especially in the homeschooling realm. And I really felt that that was what I needed to do for him. He was extremely depressed, almost suicidal at age five. And, and so homeschooling was our last resort at that point. And it was funny because I came back with the diagnosis and told my parents about this. And they're like, well, Peggy, that's you. (laughs) And I thought it is. And it it really um, shed some light on a lot of issues that I had had growing up and still personal struggles as an adult I had dealt with. And um, so all three of my kids, you would say, are on the spectrum. My only one has been officially diagnosed. And my, my oldest, and we just continued to homeschooling. It was a lifestyle we learned to love. And um, so, so yeah, my oldest is now 25 and he is a biomedical engineer and he just moved to Florida. So, um, but yeah, I've graduated too. My third one is graduating this month. So I am done homeschooling officially in a couple of weeks. <laughs> But it's been 19 years of amazingness. And I'm so excited to just be encouraging parents who are, you know, coming in the way I did, which happens more so than not. Um, Just that there are resources. I, I, I know what it's like not to have resources. I know what it's like to go to homeschool conferences and go home crying because there's nothing there. Everybody's talking about how their child's going to college when they're nine or 10, you know, and here's mine he can't read yet at nine or 10 and, and what hope is there? And it, it was, it was a hard road, but, um, but there is so much hope for our kids. We just have to walk alongside them and, and point out what they're good at because they are good at a lot. And I love what you just said, because your son is now 
he didn't start is this I told me your first son he didn't read till he's nine or ten he didn't read till he was 12 and, and then yes and you. then yep and then the next year he tested and he was at college level oh I love that that's that's a beautiful testimony mm -hmm. that is that's amazing now when we had an early conversation I um you were talking about um two E and gifted learners. Ah, yes. And so this to me is a real new, um, I've never heard of 2E when it comes down mm -hmm. to um, special needs or special education or gifted learning. Can you, um, maybe some parents have a 2E child that they don't even know? Yes, yes, that's very likely. Because a lot of times we want to point out the things that kids don't do well instead of the mix of kids that are gifted yet have learning differences. And these are what we call twice exceptional or 2E learners. And all of my kids fall on that. They're extremely smart, which makes it really difficult when they have a struggle because there's some things that they're really, really good at. And then all of a sudden when they struggle, they kind of hit rock bottom really quick, which lead to a lot of mental health issues as well. Um, and so, so for a lot of these students, what my suggestion is, I actually have a whole talk I give on the set conferences is about customizing their, their education to focus more on their giftedness. And then you work slowly on those things that they really struggle at. And so that was what we did with my son with his learning issue. Um, he was actually doing mechanical engineering at the same time he was still learning to read because I knew this was something he was good at. And so why not dive into that and, and let him see just how smart he was. And then, yeah, I'll read it or we'll have audiobooks or we'll, you know, watch videos. We can get the content in. Otherwise the reading will come, but you don't take out everything else that gives them joy so that they're good at something that they, they struggle at. Cause then all you're doing is pointing out, this is what you do bad at every day. Um, and it's defeating instead, just focus on the stuff they do good at. They will catch up with the rest because they want to have that skill to read because they're going to want to dive into to things that are only in content that are in books. And, and so that learning does happen. That is so beautiful. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I really, wow. That's very inspirational. Honestly, like, because, you know, I guess me being in the public school system, I don't get a chance to, I mean, I see it every now and then, but not to the extent where you're talking about, because mm -hmm. a child like that would have been, I mean, unfortunately, they would have been written off in, in the public school system. Because right. And a lot of times they become behavioral issues correct. in the school. And um, I know I spoke at a conference in Las Vegas last year to a bunch of educators. And I talked about how we use differentiated education in our, our homeschool. And so many of them came up to me afterwards and they said, we only dream of doing what you do yeah. because we can't. We have too many students right. to be able to do that. And that's, that's the truth of just a large classroom. Homeschooling allows you to have that customized education. I love that. And that is so very true. Oh my gosh. Um, yeah. So I guess we kind of can see who your ideal student is, right? <laughs> yes. Who you, who you focus in on. Um, but you also had mentioned early in, in an early conversation, um, customizing and optimizing um your child their child's learning can you give like a, a couple of examples how you can customize and optimize uh this type of education sure so like for my daughter she has a gift in art um and so writing was something she didn't want to do so we just spent an entire year um she wrote a magazine and of course the magazine had to have artwork. So each, each story, she wrote a short story, a long story, a restaurant review, a poem, but each one had a piece of art. And so at the end of the year, we had all this artwork and all of her writing and we actually published it. And, and so that was an inspiration to her to, to dive into all these different forms of writing that she wasn't too excited about, but the artwork she was. And so that motivated how she she wrote and what she wrote about because she was of course contemplating how she was going to draw out the pictures for the magazine so that's just one of the ways that we've done that in the past 
Wow, that I really love because now you're really focusing in on a, on a child's um, interest and love mm -hmm. of, a, um, of, a, of, a, of a topic because I love art mm -hmm. and I went all through high school hating history, like hating history. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. didn't, it, didn't compute it, didn't make sense to me. It just sounded like a bunch of dates. And <laughs> I got to college and I took art history. Oh, yes. Yeah, and we did that in high school with my daughter. Mm -hmm. I, it was like history became easy. Everything mm -hmm. I understood. I understood the dates. I understood the whys. I understood. I mean, everything became so very clear. It was unbelievable. It really, yeah. really was. Mm -hmm. Peggy, this has been an amazing conversation so far. Now we're wrapping up. What's the biggest takeaway you have for parents? What would you want parents to take away from um, all of this? My biggest takeaway is that um, you look at these homeschoolers that are out there and you think, that's not me. That's what I hear from a lot of parents. And guess what? That wasn't me either. My son came home. He was depressed. He told me, mom, God is like a bird and he's laid an egg and a snake has come and swallowed me up. And when he said that to me, I looked at him and said, that's where I'm at too. I was dealing with depression. I had anger issues. Our house was a mess. And where God has brought my family from, because we have chosen to be obedient to homeschool, has been a beautiful thing. So do not say, I can't do it, because God can do it. And he can do it through you. And he can change you. And he can change your family. So that's my, my tidbits of wisdom. <laughs> um, and I just want to encourage you there. There is community out there that understands and is willing to support you. So take that first step of faith. Oh, wow. I love that. Wow. So what's the call to action? Where can they um, uh, find your resources and connect with you? Sure. Well, our website is spedhomeschool.com. That's S-P-E-D homeschool.com. We are a nonprofit, so the majority of our resources are free. And, and so our partners actually pay for those resources to be available to you. And so they are curriculum companies, therapists, consultants, and they're listed on our website. And again, like I said, I vet them each personally. So you can trust that they are resources that are, are going to work for your homeschool. And so, um, so just looking into those, um, as well, we also have a YouTube channel with close to 900 videos on it, um, that you can search and, and some of them are my hour long broadcasts, but also we take three to five minute segments for those from each broadcast and republish them. So if you're looking for shorter content, that's available there too. Um, we have our podcast empowering homeschool conversations, and that's available just on any podcasting platform. And we've been doing that for four years. So again, there's a lot of content there too. But, um, and we also have the number one special needs homeschooling blog. So those blogs are just filled with, with lots of resources. And again, you can search our website for, for specifically what areas you're looking that you need help or encouragement. Um, we're, we're hoping we, we have everything there for you. And we focus on a different topic every month, knowing that we want to have content to cover all the questions you have and slowly we're doing that <laughs> wow okay so homeschool nation out there you have these resources at your hands you have people like peggy ployer who just have a beautiful heart who have a passion for this and i would say guys take the call to action call look at her website I mean, dive deep, take that time, carve out that time for you and your children and your family so that you guys can learn more and take mm -hmm. it, advice and, and expertise from someone who's been there, who's <laughs> done it and has a heart to walk you through it. All right. Thank you so much, Peggy. Thanks, Bex. It was awesome. Thank you. <laughs>
You can also visit my website where the episodes will be and for my free lesson plan course, which can help you if you have different vendors and you're wondering, how do I make them all flow together? Let me help you with that. And if you're a vendor and you think you would like to be on the podcast, send me an email, realedtalk at gmail.com. Leave me your name, contact, website, and I'll get back to you. Thanks for stopping in with me and I'll see you on the next time.